Restoring the Sciences. Um, our topic today is climate change, uh, uh, more specifically what we teach students about climate change. And uh, uh, while a lot of our um, the debate about climate change is centered around uh, what do the data say? Uh, if we look at certain data sets, what do they say? Do they, uh, do they uh, contradict other data sets? Uh, this is all uh, fed into, of course, the uh, politics of climate change and uh, but but uh, education is an entirely different uh, part and um, I can say from eyewitness experience that I can say from eyewitness experience that um, the education of the young people about climate is is pretty um, atrocious uh, in in my opinion and so what we're going to do is to have a conversation about just how we might rectify that so we have two uh, very distinguished guests today um, Roger Pilkey Jr. is a return uh, guest restoring the sciences welcome back uh, uh, Roger um, uh, for those of you who may not know um, he's professor of, Envir of environmental science studies at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and he's also a distinguished fellow of Japan's Institute of Ener Energy Economics. Um, he's written extensively about the interface between science policy, governance, and the science of climate change, and uh, he specializes really in comparing um, what data policy makers are using versus what uh, data actually say. And uh, uh, he, he writes uh, about this extensively on his uh, Substack site uh, called The Honest Broker. Uh, it's certainly something that uh, I think everyone interested in climate change should be, um, be uh, cognizant of. Uh, our other guest today is uh, Stephen Einhorn, and uh, Steve is a general partner in a venture fund uh, called Capital Midwest Fund. Uh, this focuses on software and technology for business to business applications, but he also has degrees in, in science. He has degrees in chemistry from Cornell University and Brooklyn Polytech uh, before he uh, became a partner in uh, Capital Midwest Fund. Uh, he ran a chemical products business, so he's very tied into uh, not only um, uh, the world of commerce, but also the world of science as well. And he is uh, the author of uh, the book that we'll be discussing today, and I'll hold it up. I hope people can see the uh, cover from, uh, from uh, behind the reflection of my tablet. It's called Climate Change, uh, uh, What They Rarely Teach in College. And this is a book that uh, falls in kind of an interesting niche. Um, it's written in a very general, readable way. Uh, it outlines lots of interesting provocative uh, questions. It's very strongly uh, uh, driven by what data actually say. And um, uh, in my opinion, uh, this is a book that should probably be in every high school uh, library uh, in the country because it does fill this niche between the science side and also the education side. So um, uh, I'd like to welcome the both of you, Steve and uh, Roger. Uh, what we're going to be doing today is uh, Steve is going to be giving us a short presentation on um, on this book and and uh, some of the messages from it and then we'll have a discussion uh, between Roger and Stephen um, and then uh, about uh, 45 to 50 minutes in we'll open it up for uh, Q&A and we'll have uh, I hope some uh, interesting questions uh, that arise from that. Um, there are a couple of ways to enter your questions. Uh, uh, we prefer that you put them into uh, the Q&A uh, uh, box, which you can access at the bottom of the, your Zoom screen. But if they come into chat, uh, that's fine too. Uh, there's no problem, but we just want to be sure that we can, uh, we can um, get to as many questions as we can. All right, Steve, so uh, fantastic book. Uh, we're all eager to hear more about it. Um, I'm going to be running the uh, presentation from my end, so please uh, just um, uh, be patient with me while I share my screen here so that we can see the, there we are, okay. So I should be sharing now and we'll just start the slideshow. Um, is the slide, Perfect. Yeah. Well, hi, Scott. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a very nice introduction. And it's a great honor to speak with you, you folks at the National Association of Scholars. 
and with Scott and Roger. We're gonna speak about global warming and climate change. And actually this has become a very important issue. Uh, there. So I wrote, the uh, next slide please. As I wrote the book, Climate Change, What They Rarely Teach in College. And when I wrote it, I had two goals. The first was to explain why all of the climate alarmist claims are false. And the second was to criticize the alarmists for their intimidation and censorship of anyone who has a different view. Next slide, please. There are three major problems there with, with this. The first is, this is the largest transfer of money in history. Uh, most people don't recognize that. But this is a transfer of money from the poor to the rich. The poor do not buy Teslas. They average $66,000. The poor are not shareholders who receive dividends from utility companies, which benefit from tax credits and subsidies for their wind turbines and solar panels. The second problem is expense. Since 2000, world governments have provided subsidies exceeding $1 trillion. The Green New Deal is gonna cost about 37 trillion if it passes, it's over $100,000 for each person. The Deficit Reduction Act, poorly named, will cost $1.2 trillion according to Goldman Sachs. So that's a problem. And finally, the alarmists claim that global warming and and, uh, and climate change are settled science, which they're not. Please go to the next slide, slide four. The, this is from 20 years ago. So the Oregon petition, it was signed by 30,000 scientists. There's never been settled science. And this is going back 20, 25 years. The, there is no convincing scientific evidence that human release of carbon dioxide, methane, or other Greenhouse gases is causing a will in the foreseeable future, cause catastrophic heating of the Earth's atmosphere and disruption of the Earth's climate. This was signed by 30,000 folks, including Edward Teller. And just two days ago, John Clauser, who won the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics, he joined the CO2 Coalition, which is one of the nation's leading groups that oppose the climate alarmists. Next slide, please. The earth is cooler since 2016. This is according to the government, the National Oceanic and, uh, and uh, Atmospheric Association and NASA. But most, most people don't know this. Did you know this? Why not? This is an important fact. It means mathematically that we've had six years of cooler weather. There is less than a 50-50 chance over the next decade that it's gonna get any warmer than it was in 2016. So this becomes a major concern and something really that we should focus and know about that there's it's unlikely that we're gonna have any sort of significant increase in temperature in the next decade or even two decades or more. Temperature decline. 1944 to 1976, that's 32 years. And carbon has increased every year, carbon dioxide. Look at the blue line, how it goes up. And you can see the red lines going up and down, but basically they're going down. So what was all this carbon dioxide doing if it wasn't heating up the atmosphere for 32 years? Now we've been told we have global warming. Um, next next slide there. Is this the slide, uh, Stephen, that you're on? Or? No, the, the next slide, please. Next slide, okay. There we go, sorry. Okay, so we have global warming, but we have global cooling too here, apparently. This is Montana and Wyoming, and guess what? They had the lowest temperatures in recorded history last year. So how is global warming uh, affecting them? Next slide, please. Okay, now what about deaths? Extreme temperatures can cause deaths, but look at the blue. The blue is cold. Many more people die, four or five times more people die from cold than heat. If we actually heated up the atmosphere or to heat it up, we'd have fewer people dying. There, slide please. Okay, 
it's carbon dioxide. Here's science from Al Gore. Of all the greenhouse gases, Carbon dioxide usually gets top billing because it accounts for 80% of total greenhouse gases. Well, uh, that's quite a statement there. Uh, this is from the most important book written on climate change, An Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore. So let's see what's happened there. Let's see what, what really is the case relating to carbon dioxide, whether it's really 80% of total greenhouse gases. Actually, carbon dioxide represents 4% of molecules that are greenhouse gases. Water vapor is 95%. Now, Gore's wrong. He's 90% he's wrong. But guess two, what two words are not in his book? Water vapor. What did he forget about? This is the, the major greenhouse gas, but he didn't mention it. Why do you think that might be? Next slide. The government has ruled that carbon dioxide is a pollutant. That means every time you have a, a soda that has carbon dioxide in it, you are polluting yourself, theoretically. But of course, that's nonsense. All plants and trees would die without our carbon dioxide. They absorb our carbon dioxide and they convert it into oxygen. Without plants, there would be no life on earth. There wouldn't be oxygen, which we need, right? So now we go to the question of why it's hot or why it's cold. The sun actually produces 99% of the thermal radiation on earth. And this is due, the amount that's due actually to carbon dioxide is one half percent. Now this is a kind of a complicated chart, but that's basically what it's telling us that 99% of all the thermal radiation is coming from the sun. It's coming from Professor Nir Sharab of the, Hebrew University in Jerusalem there. Now, just for reference purposes, in 2020, when we had the COVID, we actually had 10% less carbon dioxide generated that year. This is the largest decrease in, in uh, while we've been living of carbon dioxide for one year. And guess what? We had the second warmest year this goes to show how ineffective carbon dioxide is in generating and, and uh, generating heat. Please go to the next slide. Okay, so this is a slide of New York City sea level. It goes back 170 years. It's a straight line. What this means is that there's been no acceleration. The increase has been 2.9 millimeters per year for 170 years. When you're told that there's an increase almost yearly in acceleration of sea level, it hasn't affected New York City. Next slide, please. This is a picture of acceleration. You can see there's no acceleration. There's none at all. If for, for New York, we have a straight line because it's accelerating, or I should say the, the sea level is increasing at, at the two point nine millimeters per year, and that's it. Okay, now I'm gonna go fast over the next few slides because they basically say the same thing. Buenos Aires. Um, sea level rose four millimeters, no acceleration. Next slide. Calcutta, India. Sea level rose four millimeters per year, no acceleration. Next slide. Los Angeles, one millimeter per year. That's four inches in a century, no acceleration. Mumbai, India, 0.8 millimeters per year. Shanghai, China, next one, yeah. 8.8 millimeters per year. And Tokyo is next, 3.8 millimeters per year, slide it. Okay, what I just went through are the seven largest seacoast cities in the world that have that are that are on the coast and shown that none of them have shown any acceleration. We've been able to find virtually no place on earth where there is acceleration in terms of the sea level rising. It's not happening. But why don't 
we know it. How come so few, few, few people know this? There, It's really important because if there's no acceleration in sea level rise, since this is the largest scare that the alarmists have, it should be ignored. And we don't ignore it because we're told every day it's a problem. Next slide, please. This is from NASA, it says the same thing, except this is the Earth's increase per year, 3.4 millimeters. 3.4 uh, millimeters is, is one inch every eight years. That's all it is. And you can see that since they've been taking satellite data, it's perfectly constant uh, for this period of time. So let's see what Al Gore knows. Next slide, please. Okay, this is Al Gore versus history sea rise in history. This is the last 15 years. So Al Gore made a prediction, a near-term prediction, 20 feet. That's how much the sea was going to rise. But actually, according to NASA, the seas have risen two inches. Okay? Why should we listen to Al Gore on anything? This in particular. Okay, now we go next slide. Okay, so why is there disagreement? Disagreement because the alarmists use computer models that incorporate many uncertain values and even outright guesses. Realists forecast a continuation of past trends. Guys, this is really important. I'm going to repeat it. Why is there disagreement? Because alarmists use computer models that incorporate many uncertain values and even outright guesses, and the realists forecast a continuation of past trends. Next slide. So here's an example of just what I read. See the blue line? That's the realist line. There's been no increase in sea rise on an accelerated basis, none at all. But look at the brown line. That's the alarmist line. This is the base. They, they, they say that the sea levels are, have risen three times the acceleration during, since 1900, and they're going to rise again another three times or between, between now and the end of the century here. So. Why, how can they be so wrong? Because they don't measure the seas. If they were measuring sea level, they, we'd all agree, but they don't do that. They measure barometric pressure, they measure temperature, they see how much ice they think is, is melting off of the glaciers and the poles. Well, all they can get is approximations and their approximations are wrong. And the problem is this is the basis. This is the basis of the Paris Agreement, which is why we have all of these rules and regulations about, about um, about global warming and climate change there. Next slide. No matter who you are or how smart you are or what title you have or how many papers your site has published, if your prediction is wrong, your hypothesis is wrong. Richard Feynman, Nobel Prize winner. This is their problem. Their hypothesis is wrong and that's why their predictions are all, almost always wrong. Next slide. How about hurricanes? Well. This is from the government, the US government, the NOAA. No increase in hurricanes or cyclones for 50 years. Next slide. Major tornadoes. No increase. Look at, look at it. In fact, there's been a decrease in the number of tornadoes since 1960. There. Let's go to their other claims. This one. Fewer acres burned. This is according to the National Intergovernment Fire Center, also part of the US government. Look at the blue, that's the carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide goes up. And what happens with the, with the acreage? It comes down, the acreage burns comes down. Well, we saw that the acreage go down. Next slide. There are fewer forest fires. This is from the Forest Service and the National Interagency Fire Center. There are fewer forest fires than there, than, than there have been in the past. We should know this, next slide, because Eight, we cause 80% of all fires, fires. This is human carelessness, arson, utilities. This is according to the National Fire Service. And all of us know that a, Smokey the Bear is telling us only you can prevent forest fires. So how, why should we blame fossil fuels for the forest fires when 80% of these forest fires are human caused? Next slide. The alarmists tell us that the coral reefs will be extinct because of warmer waters and acidification. That's what they're telling us. In other words, it's let, the waters are less basic. So this is a, a picture from Palo, P-A-L-A-U. It's, it's a group of islands near the equator. They have very hot waters. They are more acidic. 
and there should be a lot of bleaching here. Well, there was a lot of bleaching. 20 years ago, there was a lot of bleaching of Palo, but then they stopped uh, using suntan lotion. They stopped refuse into the, into the waters. They stopped throwing um, garbage into the, into the ocean. And now look what they have, it's beautiful. And the Great Barrier Reef is coming back also. And the Great Barrier Reef is coming back because the farmers of the sugar farms adjacent to the, to the barrier reefs have stopped putting their refuse into the water. So now there's no more bleaching. Next slide, alarmist. US and Canadian scientists warn that we may lose most of the world's polar bears by the end of this century as climate change melts the sea ice around the Arctic. Climate change is already starving polar bears and may wipe most of them out by 2100. Well, next slide. So we're being told that the polar bears are drowning because of the ice loss. We're told that they're starving because they can't kill walruses anymore. Well, it was legal to shoot polar bears before 1970. They weren't drowning, they weren't starving, they were being shot. But in the 70s, laws were passed to make it illegal to shoot the polar bear. And now we have three times as many. We have about 30,000 polar bears in the wild versus 10,000. So save your money, don't donate it to save the polar bears. They don't need your help. Um, next slide, please. There we go. So extinct animals. We're told that global warming and climate change is causing the extinction of the animals. Well, in 2007, Al Gore, once again, predicted that 16 specific animals would become extinct. This is a picture of the Hawaiian tree frog. The problem with them is they're not going extinct. Instead, they're invasive. The concentrations in Hawaii are up to 20,000 frogs per acre. And if you want to get some help, you have to call pest control at 808-378-1866. In fact, Gore was wrong on all 16 animals, including one which he claimed was going to go extinct, but had gone extinct actually 20 years before he claimed it. Fossil fuels. Well, we know fossil fuels are are dangerous, right? Burning fossil fuels create harmful air pollution that can worsen heart disease. Okay, so the claim is that more people are dying, more Americans are dying because fossil fuels are polluting the air and they're gonna cause heart disease. So let's see what's actually happening. Next slide. Okay, this is, a, this is from the EPA, air pollution days. When you look at the US and the different cities, if you look in the bottom left, you see Los Angeles, which has more oh, air pollution days, if you will, than any other city. There are a thousand in 10 years. Uh, so there should be more people dying from heart disease. But actually, in California, there are only 190 deaths for every 100,000 people. Nationally, there are 210 deaths per 100,000 people. So the death rate in California is actually lower than average. Now, there's no connection in the US between fossil fuels and, and pollution that's killing anybody. And of course, we have the, air, the Clean Air Act from 1970s, which, which eliminated, um, which has eliminated 75% of all pollutants. Okay, next slide. Okay, Tesla. Well, everyone knows that electric vehicles save energy. Everyone knows they're good for the environment, except are they really good for the environment? To manufacture one Tesla processes about 500,000 pounds of earth. And what that means is that an average driver who's driving 12,500 miles per year has to go eight years. He's gotta drive 100,000 miles on the Tesla before it breaks even. So for the first eight years, the driver of a Tesla has actually used more energy by buying a Tesla than had he, been, had he purchased another car. Okay, next slide. There is a reasonable way to reduce fossil fuel use. And it is important that we reduce fossil fuel use. We have a limited amount. It's estimated that 100 to 200 years from now, we're out of it. There's, there's not gonna be any fossil fuels. So this is an example of, of, uh, 
of a company I'm, I'm working with called Liquid Cool Solutions. They have liquid cooling for cooling your computers. This will save 3% of all the electricity in the world if it were used to substitute for the air-cooled servers and computers that we have today. That's just as much or more energy than the $1.2 trillion that we're going to spend under the falsely named Deficit Reduction Act. Okay, so here's a summary. There's been no increase in temperature for six years. The sea level's not rising faster any year. There's no increase in hurricanes or tornadoes. The, the fires are human caused and there's less acreage. There are virtually no extinct animals, certainly none due to global warming or climate change. The coral reefs are not heading for extinction. The CO2 is good for the planet, just ask the trees. And the renewable energies in Tesla basically don't save energy. There is no climate catastrophe in sight. So the question is, why, next, next slide please. Why, why do so many people believe we have a serious problem? That climate change and global warming is the existential problem of our time, it's a catastrophe. Well, one reason is because of selective facts. So here's a headline from the New York Times. Heat-related deaths are expected to rise after 1.7 million people died in 2019 due to extreme temperatures. The only way to interpret this headline is to say it's the heat that's causing the death. But if you actually read the article, in the middle it'll say, well, there are more deaths by cold. That's an example of this false and selective facts. Next is language distortion. Next slide, please. They, 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 mix climbing, they mix climate and weather. But we know weather is the state of the atmosphere at a particular time and place. And climate is the usual weather conditions over a period of years. So every day we read in the paper something like, Hurricane Ida is proof that we have climate change and must do something about it. But I, Hurricane Ida is only a weather event. That's all it is. So I'm going, I'm going onward here. Next, next slide, please. Okay, hiding mistakes. Now you see all these lines coming upward. The red is the average. This is the this is over a hundred predictions by the UN IPCC. The UN IPCC is the are the leading alarmists in the world and the ones who actually guide the Paris Agreement. Those blue circles is what's, what's actually happened. And it's one third of the red line. How can these people be wrong 100 out of 100 times? It's because they're using projections that are not based on reality, as we spoke. How about government funding? I don't know how many professors are on the phone right now, but a professor that believes anything that I've told you just now will not get any money from the government, which spends $3 billion a year on climate change research. All of the money goes to the alarmists. None of it goes to what we'll call the climate realists, those who disagree with the, the alarmists. Censorship. If you look into Google or Bing or Char or Chat, GPT, for almost anything I've mentioned, you're going to find the common narrative first. If you look up flat growth in sea levels, the decrease in forest fires, minimal animal extinction, you're gonna to have to search really, really far before you find what's actually happening, which I've, I've said, I've showed you, and that's coming, as you know, most of which from the US government directly or objective scientific, actual scientific studies. So next, next one, please. So here's a summary of the alarmist fake news. False and selective facts, bad assumptions, language distortion, hiding mistakes, controlling funding, scaring people, censorship, intimidation, and guilt. This is a very effective plan. And it's been working. And we have to, we have to get to people what the truth really is. Next slide. There are three points that I really would like you to remember. The first is that the earth has been cooler for the last six years. 
So claims of global warming, it might, it might warm up in the future. Nobody knows exactly what's gonna happen, but there's no justification for worrying based upon the past. And there's very little chance that over the next decade, it's gonna get any warmer than 2016, which is our warmest year. Next slide, please, is that, as I've shown you, the government has proven that there is no acceleration in the sea levels. That doesn't mean the seas aren't increasing, they are, but they are averaging about one inch every eight years about, it's about one foot in a century. That's all. And this is something to remember. And the final one, and just treat this as a bonus, that since 1900, wealth has increased over 70 times and carbon dioxide has increased every year. There is no correlation between carbon dioxide and wealth, except it seems the more carbon dioxide we have, the wealthier we become. There's no justification for expecting a lo lower GDPs and, and, and poverty in the future because we have more carbon dioxide in the air there. So finally, this is my summary of why you should be happy. There's no global warming problem. There's no climate change problem. There is nothing to fear or worry about except the enormous government spending to fix these non-existing problems. So we should concentrate on the realization of worthy goals and happiness. We're blessed with a wonderful climate. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I wanted to share with you today. Okay, Steve, thank you very much for that, uh, that interesting presentation. Um, uh, for those of you who are contemplating or have bought uh, Steve's book, um, I, I, I noticed we didn't hear anything about the extensive chapter you wrote on Greta Thunberg, uh, which is one of these uh, interesting climate uh, phenomena. And I'm sure we'll get into that uh, in our discussion. But uh, for now, um, I'll just turn uh, the floor over to Roger, who will give us his perspective. Roger. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, hello, everybody. Greetings from Boulder, Colorado. Um, uh, Steve, nice to meet you, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to have uh, read your book, which I did uh, over the past week, uh, and I look forward to having a conversation. So I'm an actual in-the-flesh, real-live college professor, um, and I teach climate change, and um, I've taught climate change for a long time, almost 30 years now. Um, I did a PhD in the early 90s on uh, the role of science and climate policy, um, so I've been doing this a long time, and, and one thing I'll say is that teaching climate change uh, for anyone um, is a really difficult challenge because as you gathered from Steve's presentation, it includes uh, everything from uh, the ocean sea levels, uh, global temperature, coral reefs, hurricanes, endangered species, um, and then it gets mixed up with economics, politics, and, and societal issues. Um, so, so when we teach climate change, um, it's really important to think about, well, how do we frame the issue when we start? And, and here, I'm going to uh, disagree a bit uh, with Steve and his presentation. Um, in his book, he says um, that he's going to stick mainly to facts and, and evidence. Um, and as we heard from his conversation, um, an argument about not worrying, be happy, um, policy and politics, um, I think the proper approach to begin and to discuss climate change is in fact the one that Steve took, but he didn't admit to, which is um, why does this matter? Why do we care? Why are we spending so much time and energy talking about climate change? Um, and so I take a, a, an overt uh, policy and political framing to the issue and, and say, all right, you've heard a lot about this uh, to my college students. Um, you think what you think when you enter my class, the most important thing that, that I can teach students, and I say this, I say this every semester, I say this all the time, is I don't tell them what to think. Uh, my job is to teach them how to think. And, and in 2023, it's really difficult for anyone. It's difficult for a professor, it's difficult for students, it's difficult for citizens. How do we know what's actually known out there um, by experts, what's uncertain, what's contested, um, and what we can rely on? And the fact of the matter is that none of us have the ability to become experts in everything. And so the way that we make our way through the world is with trust. We trust institutions. You go to your, your local supermarket and you get uh, you go to the, 
the, the, the cold and flu aisle when you're sick and you buy a product that has a medicine in it full of chemicals, you open it up and you put it in your body. And you have some expectation that that medicine is going to help alleviate your systems. Um, it's not going to kill you. Your, your arm's not going to fall off. It's not poison. Um, that's not because you tested the medicine. That's not because you're uh, a pharmacist, probably, or, or a medical doctor, um, because you have trust in the institutions that deliver that expertise in the form of a, a, a medicine. Um, it's the same on complicated topics out there like COVID or climate change, um, international relations, national defense, economics, pick, pick your favorite. We have to rely on experts. And in the area of climate, um, we have, uh, as, a, as a community, um, organized uh, a scientific assessment process. Um, it's called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and, and Mr. Einhorn uh, made reference to it. Um, it's, it's, it's an organization that if it didn't exist, we would have to invent it. Because literally there are tens of thousands of papers on different aspects of climate change, all the different disciplines I mentioned, published every year. And it's impossible for any of us to sort through all that and know what's what in all these different areas of expertise. So when I am in the classroom, and um, not every professor does this, but I know a number of professors do, one of the questions um, that we ask is, how do we know that there's information out there that we can trust? And so there's two answers to this question. One is there's the substance of the issue. So for example, have there been more hurricanes? Well, hurricanes are simple. Um, in the United States, we have good records. We can count them. Um, and so I can teach my students, you know, here's, here's where you can go. Here's how you can uh, count uh, the historical record of hurricanes. What is a hurricane? How fast do winds have to be blowing? What are the data uncertainties? So we can teach substance. But for a lot of issues that are really more complicated, it's about the process of taking expertise and turning it into trusted products. Now, I've, I've been among the most vocal and critical of the IPCC. Um, in recent years, I'll advertise my previous talk I did uh, for, for the NAS uh, last year, um, which was titled Climate Misinformation. One of the problems that we have in, in climate science right now is that the IPCC is full of wonderful and good information. Uh, it also has some real howlers in there. <laughs> and I've been writing about that lately on my Substack. And the problem is you have to be an expert to know the difference. And that's a problem. Um, because it, it eats away at the trust that we should have in an institution like that. So, so would I use uh, Mr. Einhorn's book in my college classroom? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a little story, and then maybe we can open it up, and, and I'm happy to, to chat with folks. Um, about 20 years ago, Bjorn Lomborg published a book called The Skeptical Environmentalist. Um, boy, was that a big deal. Ooh, there was a campaign by leading scientists to try to get Cambridge University Press to stop publishing it. Um, there are character attacks that go on today. Um, I decided, uh, this was my first semester as a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, I decided, hey, everybody's talking about this book. I'm going to use it in the classroom. Um, I had other professors complaining. Um, I had students who didn't want to take my class. Um, and so what we did is I said, you know what, we have in my class, I don't know, 25 um, it was grad student class. Uh, I had 25 really smart grad students all studying various environmental issues. I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to divide up into groups and we are going to take a chapter each and you are going to go in and we're going to figure out um, how well did, did Bjorn do in his book. And by the end of that semester, many of the students realized, um, you know, he, he also had some howlers in there, but a lot of what he had in there was, was solid and the students learned a lot in the process. So, you know, my judgment is from reading um, Mr. Einhorn's book is um, there's a lot of good, incorrect information in there, and, but there's also a lot of howlers in there. And so if I were to use his book in my classroom, I would uh, do exactly what I did with uh, Bjorn Lomborg's book and say, all right, guys, let's, let's uh, take this apart. And in the process, uh, teach students um, the skills necessary to take any bit of information you might find. Um, you're not going to get a PhD in the topic, but you, you, you can, to some degree, sort out what's, what's what, um, but also to understand the process that is involved with verifying information, um, understanding uncertainties, and realizing that contestation is a natural part of science. Um, and for me, I, you know, I don't care where students come out, if they decide to, to be climate activists, or if they decide to, to be more skeptical, or whatever, that's, that's up to them. Um, I just hope that they learn 
in a more thoughtful way how to encounter information and realize that the, the real world's a lot more complicated than, than just two sides. So thanks for the chance to offer some comments. Thanks very much, Roger. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, it it seems to me that there are a couple of questions that we could uh, focus on. Um, uh, one is the issue of trustworthiness, Roger, that you brought up, and uh, and perhaps it'd be a uh, fruitful uh, uh, point to discuss the sources of that untrustworthiness, and the and that ties into the whole social. Uh, issue of climate change, and then there's also how do we how do we get uh, young students uh, on the right path towards the critical thinking that uh, that uh, that that you have described, Roger, in your classes. Um, but of course, you can engage with any question that you guys like. Okay. Let let me comment first, Roger. Thanks for your your thoughtful comments. I I wanted to point out that my book has almost none of my opinions in many respects. The book is based on 870 footnotes. And so anyone can look at almost anything I wrote and check the footnotes, most of which come from the US government. I tried very hard to, in the book, to keep away from politics. My theory is this, that if people understand that there really is very little problem with any of the major issues, by major issues, I mean, global warming, water rising, fires, tornadoes, hurricanes, animal extinctions, those are the major, the major issues. Then we don't spend money on it. So, but it, it doesn't make sense to go into government um, actions until one actually believes, and I, I think Roger put it well, that you, the, the students should think about it, but when you think about it, actually look at the facts, it's hard, to come up with a conclusion that we actually have a problem. And if we don't have a problem, we shouldn't be spending money on it. That I leave to the, to the reader. So here's, this is a great opportunity to talk about how, how we approach issues and how we, how we teach them. Because, and I think the IPCC has historically made the same sort of mistake. The, the natural idea is, well, let's start with the science. Right. Let's 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 do a survey of what we know and what we don't know, um, and then we can assess whether we have a quote unquote problem or not. Um, as an aside, I'll point out that that classifying a situation we encounter in the world as a problem is a political act. Um, is is the U.S. deficit a problem? Well, I can find you an economist who will tell you it's a huge problem, and I can find one that'll say, "Don't worry about it." Um, the definition of a, of a problem requires integrating what we value. Um, with some sense of risk and some sense of the future, it's, it's inherently a political act. When I teach climate change, I start—I don't start with climate science. I actually start with the, the global energy system um, because that's what we're we're talking about is both the the potential cause of um, the problem for those who think there is a problem, but also it's it's wrapped up in the solution. And um, it was interesting to see that uh, Mr. Einhorn talked about um, you know liquid cooling can reduce. Uh, electricity use. And that's what I talk about with my students is, in fact, the case for decarbonizing the global economy is much broader than um, what you find in IPCC reports, much, much broader. So if you are in a Germany or Poland um, and you want to um, reduce your reliance on fossil fuels from, from Russia, um, then your security is enhanced by by decarbonizing your your energy system. Um, if you I spent much of the past spring in Southeast Asia, horrible horrible air pollution. A lot of it's from burning agricultural lands, but also a lot of it is from uh, cars and and coal fired power plants. Um, air pollution is a real risk um, to people's health, and and that's that's um, out there, and and it's it's you know pretty solid science. And if you wanted to improve health outcomes in Southeast Asia, then decarbonization makes sense. Um, in the United States, um, coal has been on its way out, and it will probably uh, just just by economics, even without a regulatory push, but it'll it'll be gone in the next ten years. Um, It'll be replaced by natural gas, nuclear, wind, solar, pick your favorite, but whatever replaces it is going to act to decarbonize the US economy. Um, and so once students understand that, hey, the, you know, the world and, and significant parts of it have been decarbonizing for over a century, um, and what climate policy is about is accelerating decarbonization, they have a very different 
perspective. Uh, when I talk to people um, like Mr. Einhorn, who have a, a more skeptical view of climate science, you know, I can make a pretty strong case um, for, for cleaning up our energy system. You know, maybe not net zero, maybe it doesn't get there, but um, there's a lot more agreement by people across the spectrum of, of views on science um, on the policy and politics. So after I introduce policy and politics um, and the framing of the issues, then we get into issues of, of climate science and so on. Um, and you know, there, there, I will readily admit, uh, you, you pick a topic, um, many topics, there's a diversity of views, but on other topics, there certainly is no diversity of views, um, such as you know what Mr. Einhorn said correctly. Um, I think it's widely known and accepted that we have not seen globally an increase in tropical cyclones. Um, and that's you know that's in the IPCC reports. Um, it's it's in the US National Climate Assessment. So you know there are areas that are pretty solid, settled, uh, science and having students understand where those are and where they're not is is key. Um, the last thing I'll say on that is that the most successful policies that we implement um, as a country and around the world are those that are robust to scientific debates and scientific uncertainty. Um, if you can make decisions that make people wealthier, that make people safer, that make them more secure, that make them healthier, um, you're going to get support from the left and the right. And you know that's that's what I think is missing in a lot of climate policy is that as as Mr. Einhorn says, page one seventy two, today in the U.S. and throughout the world, there's a war between activists and realists. It's a war for our minds, our emotions, and our pocketbooks. Well, if you start out framing it as a war, you're going to have a fight. Um, and so, um, my perspective is that it, it, we don't have to teach this as a war. We can teach this as an opportunity to think through a really complicated issue where people naturally have a lot of different views. Just going to jump in here very briefly. Um, you know, the the uh, subtitle of uh, Stephen's book is uh, something along the lines of uh, "What's how climate change is being taught and and what you're not being told in in in, in college." And and uh, I alluded at the beginning that I've I've actually sat in on some uh, some exercises for teaching uh, students about climate change and. It strikes me that 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 is a very serious aspect of this because, you know, I, I, you know, R Roger, you 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 stand out as a model professor, you know, teaching both sides of the of the thing, uh, guiding students towards how to think about it for themselves and so forth. But what you uh, well, this is just anecdotal on my part, but uh, uh, there is this uh, tendency to. Um, to actually not teach it correctly and to not do the kinds of things that 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 you're describing, Roger. And and, and so, I'll 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 just throw this question out to the both of you. You know, you know, you know, are we actually teaching climate change, especially to younger students, high school seniors, and college freshmen? Are we actually teaching the issues of climate to them objectively and you know open-mindedly? Uh, or uh, are we not? And if not, how can we turn that around? You want to go first, Roger? Sure. Yeah, I mean, all right. So university education is something, um, you know, I, I, th I think about a lot and I do a lot and I have some pretty strong views. Um, you know, what, and, and let me just say that the, the, the issues that I'll raise are not certainly not limited to, to climate. Um, you know, one of the things that we're doing in university education is we're, you know, certainly we're we're providing students with skills, knowledge, um, and you know capabilities to enter the job market, to have future employment. And um, but another thing we're doing is we're creating citizens um, and people who can critically think, um, whatever their political views happen to be. And and one of my complaints about the way that that university education often works is that it's it's we're instead of building citizens, we're building really good Jeopardy contestants, um, <laughs> that they learn a lot of stuff about a lot of stuff, um, but they don't learn how to put the pieces together in some coherent way. I mean, just what we've talked about here, one of the most important things that uh, a citizen can do is to try to understand why an issue is viewed as, as a problem. We live in a country where some people think we need no immigration. Other people think we need to have massively more immigration. Those are two completely different aspects of what the quote unquote problem is. And being able to sort through, well, why is it that people disagree? And understanding that disagreement is legitimate 
um, requires frameworks, knowledge, uh, skill and understanding and communicating with other people. And universities aren't very good at that. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not one, I don't like the, the you know, transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary word. Um, you know, what, what we're teaching students how to do is to be good decision makers and understanding context. And we just don't do that very well. And we don't do that very well in, in climate, certainly. So, so yes, universities can and should do better. That said, I know a lot of professors. Um, <laughs> I know a lot of professors. And um, I don't recognize, there are certainly some that fit the characterization that Mr. Reinhardt had, but I don't recognize very many that fit that bill. Um, so if we're going to fix climate education, you know, I would say, hey, let's just go a little further and fix university education <laughs> more broadly. It's a huge challenge, but it's it's important. Steve, what's your thoughts on this? I think Colorado is very lucky to have Roger. Roger actually presents the non-common viewpoint as well, as well as the other viewpoint, okay. objectively. Problem is, we have a shortage of Rogers. Uh, to be objective, and I don't mean this to be pejorative, but the fact is that almost all climate professors in the United States have one side. I'm not guessing on this. This is not an opinion, it's an opinion, but it's opinion based upon quite a bit of work. I've been trying to find one professor of climate change in Wisconsin who will debate me. There is no debate in Wisconsin. It is settled science. There are 40 teachers of professors at UW-Madison that teach something related to climate science. Not one of them will debate the issue. There's no response. I'm not allowed to speak on campus. Even the deans whom I've spoken to will not allow me to come and talk at one class. So as far as diversity of opinion goes, there should be, Roger's right. But I would say there's much less diversity than most of us would want. It's really very, very one-sided. And the result of that is that we're heading in the wrong direction. We have a government, and this will be political, let's acknowledge political. The Biden administration has put forth a weaponization of climate change. Every department now has to decide what to do to address climate change. One thing I have never heard is a valid exp explanation or even a reasonable explanation of how anything we do is going to affect temperatures by one half degree centigrade, which is the difference between what's going to be a catastrophe or acceptable according to the Paris Agreement. So, uh, Raj, I'm kind of agreeing with you that there should be debate. In fact, I do agree there should be debates and discussions and different views, but I think we both could agree that there's much less of an acceptance of even discussing different views than there should be on campus. And that's why I wrote this book and I called it what they rarely teach in college, because I think that's true. Please comment. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, I think one of the things I agree most strongly with what you wrote about in your book is, um, and I would I would make it a little bit more precise, um, is that there's a bit of chill in the in the atmosphere, so to speak, when it comes to um, engaging a diversity of views um, on college campuses. Um, I have colleagues uh, on the Boulder campus who are. Um, promoting uh, the importance of viewpoint diversity. Um, they're members of the Heterodox Academy. Some people may have, have heard about that. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to have you, uh, Mr. Reinhardt, beam into my class uh, when I next teach climate change and have you talk to my students. I had Alex Epstein in my class, um, and I'm, you know, perfectly happy to have people like Michael Mann or Greta Thunberg if she, you know, if she wanted to come into my class. Um, the point is of being a professor is not to protect students from. Um, from views, but to expose them to views and teach them how to make sense of them. But let me say, in, in the academy, there is a chill. Um, climate change is an example of multiple issues where, um, I mean, I'll just tell you a story. When a long time ago, this was 25 years ago, um, I was a scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. On the side, um, because I like teaching, I was teaching a class 
uh, with a preeminent atmospheric scientist uh, named Peter Webster, who has since uh, he left, went to Georgia Tech and is now retired. And we said, what we're going to do is we're going to recreate the climate debate in our classroom. And we're going to do that by bringing in people with different perspectives. And one of the perspectives was uh, a, a scientist named Fred Singer. Um, who has since passed away, who was a well-known, uh, I think by his own description, climate skeptic. And um, I had my job threatened inside NCAR for bringing him into town. This is 25 years ago. So, so I'm, you know, I'm no stranger to the, the chill that goes through. And I mean, the, one of the problems is that there are, a, it's a small number of the most vocal, the most political and the most powerful academics and scientists um, in the climate space that, that, kind of make it difficult, particularly for junior scholars. I have a lot of conversations with a lot of people who are not prominent, who are not senior, who are not particularly political, who would love to teach more like I do. Um, but, you know, either <laughs> I'm a full professor with tenure and I don't care. Um, and so not everyone has those, those privileges. Um, but I, I do think that inside the community of climate and climate science and climate academia, there is a much broader Diversity. I hate to use the term silent majority because we all, all know where that comes from. But I do think there's a lot of people who, who appreciate and welcome viewpoint diversity and probably wish that they had more freedom in the academy to express that. And that's just a sad statement of where um, some, some issues are in the academy. So I think both of you agree that there's a problem in the academy with, that, that seems to be uh, falling down on the on its 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 mission of promoting the very kinds of things that I think we all agree uh, uh, is our proper think, goal, which is I to, think one, yeah, let's go, is, Scott, yeah. Sorry, I, I think it it might be interesting for for us to talk a little bit about why there is such a majority opinion. Then how can how can any most anything I I wrote or said be correct? if the great majority disagrees with almost everything, which we hear every day. So Roger, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. And yeah. the reason that, because it's a very, it's an important question, right? Why, why do the majority of people have a feeling that um, we really have a big problem here? So again, I mean, so the definition of a problem is, you know, it's, it's not solely a function of science. Um, but I will say, and you know, this is from some of our research and some of uh, colleagues, particularly my colleague Justin Ritchie, that the climate community has um, for a long time relied on scenarios to underpin its work. Um, and these scenarios were developed 20, 25, 30 years ago. And the most commonly used scenario, um, and for, for uh, aficionados out there, it's called RCP 8.5, um, dominates the literature and has a very extreme future. Now you couple this with, you know, around, well, you, you mentioned Al Gore. Um, Al Gore's more of a historical footnote now, but um, his movie was very influential. I mean, in 2006, I won an award for my research from the National Academy of Sciences, the Roger Rovell Award, which uh, he was Al Gore's student. The next month after that, An Inconvenient Truth came out with Hurricane Katrina. Um, as its centerpiece. And for better or worse, uh, advocacy groups around the world have decided to latch on to extreme weather as the symbol, the most important sign of climate change. Um, even though, you know, as you correctly say, the IPCC reports don't um, support that, uh, you know, extreme weather may get worse in the future and there are projections of that. But at this point, um, you know, you, you know, it's limited. And that's what the most recent IPCC said. So we have extreme scenarios. We have an advocacy campaign focused on the event that just happened. And we have a chilling atmosphere in the scientific community where, you know, the, the, the worst thing that you can be labeled in climate academia is a climate denier. That's a career ender. Um, I, trust me, I know I was investigated by the U.S. Congress uh, with such a claim. Um, so, so people tiptoe around these issues. So it's not any one issue. It's not always politics. Um, but there is this, this momentum to make climate change all-encompassing, to reduce, as Mike Hume says, to reduce everything to climate. Um, and again, this is why being in the classroom is so important. When we talk about energy policy, we talk about adaptation to floods, hurricanes, fires. Um, sure, climate change is an, is an element we should talk about, but there's a lot of other things. And you know, for me, when students 
um, <laughs> when they leave my class, you know, I have a joke. I tell them, I say, you know, you come into the class, you're probably confused about things. And when you leave, you know, I'm not promising clarity, but you're still going to be confused, but at a much higher level of confusion. <laughs> well, let me just add to that a little bit then. That I think one the reasons, uh, reasons are multiple. You mentioned a, a few of them there, Roger. But the reasons that uh, most people ac accept that we have a major problem, it's include there are some people for which this is a lot of money. Many people, this is a great deal of money. $1.2 trillion is a huge amount of money from the government. Al Gore is worth over $300 million for doing very little. And so money is really a major issue. I think to this group thing, people don't have time to look into all these issues. It's very complicated. And so they go along with people and things they trust, like perhaps the, the New York Times. So the majority actually really don't, they don't know, they don't feel strongly and they can't defend it, but they just support it. And then there's the intimidation and, and censorship that I mentioned. But one thing we didn't mention, which is very important, is power and control. This is a major factor because if you can claim that the carbon dioxide molecule is a pollutant, you can control almost anything, right? Not only must you have electric cars, or wind or solar energy, but you can also demand that people don't eat meats, that they must pay carbon taxes, and they're not only allowed to invest money or even loan money to companies that produce the wrong type of fuels. So it's a power and control is a, is a very good incentive for many people who want that power and control, which is many of our leaders, unfortunately. That was a highly political statement in case no one knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, so, I mean, you raise some important points because, you know, we hear a lot in the climate space that that there there are experts out there who are funded by fossil fuel interests. And and one of the problems, again, another problem that we have in, in academia is um, nowadays, particularly with the Inflation Reduction Act, there's a, there's a lot of money floating around um, for renewables, in particular wind and solar. And there are, in fact, a lot of academics who are cashing in and, you know, more power to them. Good for them. Um, everybody should make, be able to make a buck. The problem is, is that the community doesn't hold academics to the same standards of conflict of interest, um, depending on what technology and what industry they happen to be um, getting their, their funding from. Um, on the issue, and, and I hear this a lot, and I'm in a lot of discussions where people are, are you know, are worried about the costs of climate policy. Um, I have to say, I'm not terribly worried about, I mean, sure, governments implement inefficient policies all the time. I'm not sure climate policy is, is special or different in that respect. I'm also not worried that that energy prices are going to you know, go through the roof because people won't let it happen. And it doesn't matter if, uh, if they are in democracies or not democracies. Um, once the price of energy goes up, even by a few pennies, um, that's when we see the yellow vests in France and so on. So there is, you know, there is a check on um, policy making that is inefficient and costly. And the only way, I've said this for a long time, the only way that climate policy works is if it helps us get wealthier um, and people get jobs and we have better security and the positive benefits are realized in the short term. Um, they have to be realized on electoral timescales. You can't promise someone they're going to, you know, their grandkids are going to be really, really rich. <laughs> they need to see it in the, you know, in their their taxes or their paycheck in the next year or two years or four years. So I'm not too worried about that. Um, there, are, Sure, there's a lot of policies out there, and I view the Inflation Reduction Act, which I supported as an experiment. Um, we're going to know in probably two or three years if it's working. And if it is, Good, more power to them. And if it's not, then guess what? You know, you had your chance, time to change course. So, so I mean, it's a great policy laboratory. It's great for students to learn. It's great for people to have constructive disagreements on these topics. So, um, I, you know, your last slide, this is the last thing I'll say, I said, you know, be happy. I'm, I'm pretty optimistic and happy about these things, even though there's some inefficiencies in policy and, you know, academia has its own problems. But, um, you know, I think we can sort through those. Roger, I, I would hope that you might reconsider something. We spent, according to the Congress, $400 billion. And what are we getting for it as far as reducing temperatures in the world or accomplishing anything they want? Virtually nothing except paying people $400 billion 
which we are now responsible for. We have $400 billion of debt, which right now is an additional $20 billion of interest that we have to pay. We're leaving this to your kids and our children. And so I really wish you would reconsider and say, look, unless we're going to get something of real value from this, which no one has pointed out anything to me of that I understand, and maybe I'm just narrow-minded, I see nothing of value here because I don't see any particular major problem that we're solving or any problem really whatsoever. So I really wish you would reconsider that. The $400 billion of debt is, is significant. And the people who don't think that the $30 trillion of deficit that we have in the U.S. right now today is not one of the biggest long-term problems because we do know from history, and this is solid history from 2000 years, we know that if you have too much of a deficit and you have inflation, you have hyperinflation and your civilization crumbles. So please reconsider that portion. Yeah, anyway, let me just to clarify. So when you say 400 billion, you're referring to the projected cost of the Inflation Reduction Act? Yeah. The the subsidies, yeah. So, I mean, here's how I look at it. And and you know, I've been a critic of global temperature targets since, you know, forever. Um they're not particularly policy relevant. They're not meaningful. They're long term. Um for me, I mean, the the question is if if the US is going to adopt an industrial policy that includes subsidies, for energy technologies, carbon capture, wind, solar, maybe some uh, nuclear. There, there is a huge upside economic opportunity over the next decades as two, three, maybe four billion people around the world um, strive to get access to energy services that all of us enjoy and we don't think twice about. And some, some companies, some people, some experts, some countries are going to be the ones that are helping to build out the, the grid and the energy infrastructure of the world. And so if uh, US industrial policy helps to build up a base of expertise that can be exported, that can help Southeast Asia, eventually across the continent of Africa to build out energy systems, um, my kids and grandkids are gonna be pretty wealthy people because they're going to have opportunities. This is one of the things I'm I'm worried about is that the partisan debates in the US lead to gridlock. Um, you know, the the the, Vol the Vogel nuclear power plant is about to go online in Georgia. Um, and it's probably the last um, commercial large scale legacy nuclear power plant that that you know I'll see in the US in my lifetime. Maybe advanced nuclear. Meantime, uh, China is is rolling out a nuclear power plant about one one a month, um, bringing it online. Um, so if you ask, well, well, what country has the expertise to build out the energy infrastructure of the 21st century? Uh, my concern is it's not going to be the U.S. because people are fighting about climate change and it becomes so politicized. Um, so, so I guess my response to to your concern is yes, I do see there's a lot of potential for waste and and inefficiencies in the Inflation Reduction Act, but at the same time, you know, looking at the glass half full part, um, you know, if if you want to get a nuclear engineering degree, um, there's not many places you can go in the U.S. I talked to the folks who are um, who are building Vogel recently, and they said one of the challenges they have is finding people who have expertise to actually work in their plant, uh, because uh, the folks who were in the nuclear industry in the 1970s are all retired and gone, and we don't teach it anymore in universities. So that's another problem we could talk about with universities. So I tend to view the IRA more as an industrial policy than it is a global temperature knob. Um, and I think getting hooked up on it as a global temperature knob might distract us from the more bigger, you know, global competitiveness issues that that are really where the future lies. Well, I'm reluctant to jump in on this really fascinating debate that's going on between the two of you, but I do want to give our uh, listeners uh, uh, the chance to um ask their questions. And so uh, I'm just going to have to go through and very selectively uh, look at some of these things, unfortunately, because we are uh, getting towards the end of our time. Uh, uh, one uh, of our uh, listeners, uh, C. Chiaffi, um, brought up the issue of the uh, 
uh, Clintel organization, C-L-I-N-T-E-L.org, who uh, is presenting themselves as an alternative to the uh, IPCC. And uh, he, he, uh, he or she starts off the question with uh, the frozen climate views of the IPCC. And uh, uh, the Clintel group is a group of dissident scientists. I wonder if either of you could, uh, could respond to uh, uh, Dr. Chiaffi's question. I'm happy to. Uh, I, I, I've i known Marcel Kroc, who's uh, one of the editors of that report. I've read the report. I'm going to be writing on it, advertisement in my Substack coming up. I mean, I'm featured in the report <laughs> in multiple places. Um, they're not an alternative to the IPCC. Um, and what that report does is it has a, an interesting combination of um, alternative views of the science and allegations of error in the IPCC. Um, and I'm far more interested in errors that creep into these big assessment reports than alternative views. Um, the IPCC should be bringing folks with alternative views inside the tent, so to speak. Um, and if they don't, that's a problem. Um, but there are, in my view, a number of important errors in the IPCC that um, should cause the organization to um, tighten up its procedures. I mean, this happened, you know, long time people in this space remember there was an error in the fourth assessment report related to glaciers in Southeast Asia, uh, maybe in the Himalayas that were, were supposed to melt by 2035. Turns out that was false and they had a big investigation. And they, and to their credit, they made some steps to try to improve the organization. Um, the Clintel group in the Netherlands um, has documented that, well, maybe we're back in 2007 with some, some significant errors. Um, I don't see much interest in the community in addressing, acknowledging, or responding to those. Um, so and, and the last thing I'll say, the IPCC, I mean, I'm an expert. I know this field. I've been, you know, I've written on it for, for decades. The IPCC, by and large, does a very good job. Um, my dad, who's an atmospheric scientist, um, you know, has complaints about their treatment of land use effects on climate. Um, I have complaints about how they treat disasters. Um, but you know, it's, it's a 10,000 page report um, if you take all three working group assessments. And there's obviously a lot of super really good, great science in there by wonderful scientists. Um, the problem, as I said earlier, is that for the non-expert separating the wheat from the chaff, the baby from the bathwater, um, at this point becomes difficult. Um, and uh, so for me, you know, tighten up those procedures so that the trust is at a much higher level. And that is what I think the Clintel group is 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 aiming towards. Yeah. Roger knows much more about this than I do. So I'm just gonna make one comment. I've only had very limited contacts with the IPCC. The strongest contact related to what's happening with the seas. And I spoke to one of the leaders in the United States, actually she works with Brown University and she explained that the acceleration in sea levels has been three times since 1900, and it's going to be three more times by 2100. So I asked her, where actually has this occurred? It's a very simple question. Where has it occurred? And she couldn't find any place. So I pointed out the seven major. Um, these extreme scenarios are the basis in New Zealand and the United States and Canada and elsewhere um, for, for making decisions about adaptation. And if we're using out of date scenarios, then we may be adapting to futures that are now deemed you know, low likelihood or implausible. So one of the things climate science has to do is keep up. And you know, the, one of the challenges for the IPCC is it's always in arrears. I mean, this most recent, um, Synthesis report was assessing science that was um, produced in the last 10 years. Well, you know, a lot happens in 10 years. So if you're planning, you know, your airport runways in San Francisco for 2040 or 2050, um, it's not good enough to be relying on scenarios that were produced in 1995 or 2000. So, so there are some real issues here. I don't see those as particularly IPCC issues. I see those as a community issues. And you know, the last thing I'll say on that, so much of climate science has become oriented around raising awareness, mobilizing support, getting people excited about climate change, is that um, I think in some cases the, the, the scientific integrity and accuracy of the underlying science sometimes, not always, but sometimes takes a back seat. Um, to, to getting a message out. And that's, that's never a good place for any science community to be in. 
But so, let me comment on that, Roger, because I think you, you brought up an excellent example of exactly what I'm concerned with. The sea levels around San Francisco are rising at about two millimeters per year. That is eight inches in a century. How much should we spend at the airport to address eight inches a century? My guess is it's gonna be several billion dollars. Is it really worth it? Is it really a problem? Or is this a manufactured problem by some folks who say the acceleration is gonna increase significantly? I mean, this is exactly the sort of problem that you get in a place, you have a specific set of decisions, you have a budget, you have cost benefit analyses. I mean, this is where, I mean, for me, this is where I want my students to be able to, to enter. And, you know, as they have careers, some of them will be producing cost benefit analyses for San Francisco International Airport and understanding what's good information, what's not good information. Um, as you say, I mean, people are going to weigh, weigh costs and benefits. Um, my concern is that if things are overstated, um, using extreme scenarios as you know as the world moves into the future and the catastrophe doesn't happen the world's going to cross 1.5 degrees celsius you know within a decade and the world's not going to end I hate to <laughs> disappoint anyone but the world's not going to end at 1.5 degrees uh, what happens then what does the community do after raising expectations and you know you know talking about tipping points and a cliff edge and so on so again playing it straight with the science is always the best strategy in my view let me go into that because you brought up another point that really requires clarification. Roger, you're completely right. The IPCC claims that there's going to be 1.5 degrees centigrade increase by 2050, at least. The problem is we're only talking about a half a degree between now and 2050 because that one degree has already occurred. They're saying since 1840, it's gone up by one and a half degrees. Okay, so let's clarify that we're talking about one half degree. Now they say the difference between one half degree and one degree is going to be a tremendous difference. But if any of us get into a car with another person and close their eyes and say, please increase the temperature by one degree Fahrenheit or decrease it, don't tell me which. We can't even identify that. It's such a small amount. What's actually amazing to me is how consistent the climate has been. For 150 years, every year has been plus or minus one degree. That's it. It's a very narrow range. It's really remarkable. And yet we talk about climate change. There is climate change over a thousand years. There's gonna be a lot of climate change, but there's little historical justification, at least for the last hundred years, that there's gonna be major uh, change in any respect over the next 20, 30 years. So in my in my book, I, I wrote about this and you can read actually my dad had a nice blog on the, the radiative effects of carbon dioxide on the atmosphere. Um, you know, I will point out most, of the relevant experts at atmospheric sciences don't hold Mr. Einhorn's view on that. For me, the issue is, and this is why temperature targets are not a particularly useful policy metric. Um, we, those, the, the, at best, they're an outcome. Emissions are an outcome. What we can control is how we use energy and how we produce energy. And we should always be striving for cleaner, cheaper, um, smaller footprint, so there's less land use um, energy sources. So, so, you know, when we, when we move from talking about temperature targets and, you know, there's a bazillion papers out there on the effects of 1.5 versus two degrees and so on. I don't find that particularly useful for discussing climate policy. Um, it's much better to get into the energy space and say, well, you know what? A country like Nigeria has a huge population full of youth. Um, everyone in Nigeria wants to be rich and consume energy like Americans or Europeans. How's that going to happen? And once we start getting into the details of, you know, development in particular countries, um, we see that these, these, these big debates that people like to have on Twitter and at international conferences over temperature targets kind of fall by the wayside. If I could just uh, jump in here, we're approaching the end of our time and uh, there are several questions that have come in in the chat and the Q&A that I'd, um, I'd kind of like to just uh, Combine into one summary. I'm going to try and do as fair a job as I can on this. Uh, you know, what uh, it's pretty clear that there's a very strong political dimension to 
uh, climate, the whole issue of climate. Uh, uh, when you have uh, politics, you inevitably have contention, and then you also have the issue of how you build up trust and where, if there's no trust there, where does it come from? And so um, uh, Dr. Chaffee uh, also makes a point. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's received several uh, Office of Naval Research and NSF grants, never allowed ideological students, and he makes the very good point. These kinds of things should not be criminal or instrumentalized by ideologues. Uh, and so I, that echoes some of the things that you have been saying, uh, Roger. Well, both of you have been saying, uh, actually. Um, uh, the uh, commenter, uh, Tretioshu, I, I hope I pronounced that uh, correctly, um, it ties in, well, what role does the globalist agenda, which is inevitably a political issue, what role does that have in the in the, in the climate uh, campaign? Um, uh, Daniel Bonavac and uh, uh, Mary uh, addresses the issue of uh, nuclear power. And uh, uh, we know that uh, various countries uh, have a very fearful relationship with nuclear power. Uh, Daniel Bonavac asks, uh, well, isn't the lack of nuclear expertise a product of earlier environmental scare tactics? That is a kind of uh, 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 moral hazard or moral panic about this. And, and uh, of course, climate uh, uh, can be an example of that. Uh, Mary would like to know what happened to the Fort St. Brain uh, nuclear plant in Platteville, Colorado, was shut down in 1989. So that's kind of a grab bag of things. But they seem to all be tied into into who can we believe? Uh, uh, do I trust this person, and so forth? So, uh, if 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 you all, if the both of you would just please comment on that uh, very quickly. Um, yeah. Well, my my thought is that as far as what we should have confidence in and support are those that base their decisions and their recommendations on history. Not computers. Computers, it's too complicated. And I think Roger would agree with me. To actually forecast something with a computer is very complicated if you're not going to the basic, the basic information. So my recommendation is just to go back to history and predict that more than likely what's happened in the last 20, 30, 40 years is going to happen in the next 20, 30, 40 years, because there's been very little climate change as I've spoken about for about 20 minutes today yeah let me let me i guess have my my ending comments focused on education uh, at the university level we're in a, a precarious time right now i mean i talked a little bit in the climate case about the chilling effects that we do to ourselves inside the academy but that's not the only challenges that universities are facing um, there are places um, like texas florida wisconsin where state legislators are trying to either eliminate tenure or mandate what, what professors can teach. Um, I tell you, nobody's going to tell me what I'm going to teach in the classroom. Um, and I got tenure. And um, if they want to get rid of it, then I'm going to go do something else. Um, we need to, to stand by our universities and, and protect professors from meddling politicians, typically on the right these days, but also meddling colleagues, typically on the left, who are chilling academic freedom from inside. Um, that's that's what's going to serve our our kids, young people the best um, is letting professors do what they do best, um, which is teach in their classroom and ensure that viewpoint diversity is is respected and that universities themselves reflect a diversity of view in the people they employ and the teachers that are in the classroom. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> let me just uh, uh, bring this fascinating conversation to a close. I thought it was really interesting. Uh, uh, thank you both for uh, for contributing your uh, points of view, interesting uh, differences of opinion, and so forth. So um, I'd like to just uh, end with a kind of a, excuse me, Non-serious question, as he describes it, from our friend Randy Wayne at uh, Cornell University, uh, is the chilling of speech a way to slow global warming? <laughs> so <laughs> I think that uh, kind of encapsulates the whole issue of, uh, of political interests and uh, censorship and whatnot uh, in kind of a humorous uh, uh, way, way, way of expressing it. So um, again, thank you. Thanks to the both of you for um, your your willingness to debate this question uh, uh, very carefully. 
I was not able to get to all the questions because uh, we were having such a fascinating discussion here. If you have a question that you would like answered, just please send it to me at turner at nas.org, and I will try to uh, either answer it or pass it on to uh, one of our uh, panelists here. Um, and let me just uh, close by inviting you to uh, come to the next episode on May 19th of Restoring the Sciences, uh, our topic that day will be uh, artificial intelligence and chat GT GPT, whether it's a threat or not. And uh, um, and please join us. Uh, our guests will be uh, Joab Stalan Greba, Barry Smith, and Stephen Peterson, who have very different uh, views on this uh, subject. So uh, do please uh, look out for it and uh, join us on that day. Again, Roger and Steve, thank you both for appearing on our webinar today. And uh, um, it was wonderful. That's well, thanks for having us. I'm yeah. sure we both very much appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. thank you very much. I appreciate your participation. Okay, good day, all.